Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Herit uh, Naughty Oak Baptist Church uh, midweek prayer meeting. Uh, we're going to be starting with uh, hymn 410, Faith is a Victory. So please stand, and Brian's going to lead us in song. Beautiful. Amen. It's number 410, Faith is the Victory. Let's sing it out unto the glory of the Lord this evening. <clears throat> and camped along the hills of light, Ye Christian soldiers, rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, a glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our love to love aflame, we'll vanquish all the hosts of night. In Jesus' conquering name, faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good singing tonight. Praise the Lord. Let's turn back to 378. 378. Give me a passion for souls, dear Lord. May this be our prayer today, each and every one of us. <clears throat> Give me a passion for souls, dear Lord, a passion to save the lost. Oh, that thy love were by all adored and welcomed at any cost. Jesus, I long, I long to be winning men who are lost and constantly sinning oh may this hour be one of beginning the story of pardon to tell though there are dangers untold and stern confronting me in the way willingly still I go nor turn, but trust thee for grace each day. Jesus, I long, I long to be winning 
Men who are lost and constantly sinning, oh may this hour be one of beginning the story of pardon to tell. How shall this passion for souls be mine? Lord, make thou the answer clear. Help me to throw out the old lifeline to those who are struggling near. Jesus, I long, I long to be winning men who are lost and constantly sinning. Oh, may this hour be one of beginning the story of pardon to tell. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. Thank you. God, the blessed week tonight. It's cooler here than in the other building. Hope you had a good meal. Those of you who came out to eat with us. Father, we thank you for this Thursday evening preaching and praying service. Help us, Lord, to lay the emphasis on praying. Now prepare us in all the ways we need to be prepared for the gospel meetings next August through September. Lord, help us to bathe the entire five or six weeks in prayer, including the events leading up to those days and the events that will follow. Please, Lord, help us to, to apply ourselves to prayer. Give us a burden, Lord, for the things that burden you, beginning with the state of affairs in this world and then our country, our state, our church, our own families, our own selves. Help us to be confident, Lord, that if we ask anything according to your will, you will hear us and answer us according to our prayer. This is your promise, Lord, given to us about a dozen times in your book. So help us to pray confidently and at the same time be listening to you and communing with you that if we are not praying according to your will with regard to what we ask or how we ask for it, we would modify and bring our request in line with your will. Because we want your will done, Lord. This is how you taught us to preface our praying not my will, but thine be done. We know, Lord, your will is not always done. No matter what the, the foolish teachers and preachers say, it could not be your will for a murderous gang of radical Islamists to be moving house to house to kill Christians and innocent children. That could not be your will, Lord. That's certainly not what you want, although we understand you've allowed it. We also know that you won't make us do things against our will. Lord, we we want to learn about prayer. You told us it's one of the weapons of our warfare. Help us to utilize it, Lord, in a proper way. We wouldn't want to enter into your presence knowing that the potential of our lives was largely unmet. And that because of us, perhaps, more tragedies took place and we're more tragic than they should have been because of our apathy. Help us, Lord. 
help churches like ours across the nation here, especially in New England, to, to lay hold of your word, to believe it, to preach it and teach it and live it, have confidence in it, to be changed by it and to apply it to our daily lives. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us to resist the devil in his whispers, or sometimes even shouts. Help us learn how to deal with the pressure of the world, the peer pressure, because we are outnumbered, Lord, by a, a great margin. But we know that greater is you, the one that lives within us, than he that is in the world. So help us tonight. Bless our guests. May you be glorified, and may we be edified, and may they be well nourished. Be with those in our assembly who are hurting, Lord. And there are many. We especially pray for Deb tonight, that you give her comfort as she sits here in this room, Lord. Uh, remove uh, the pain that might necessitate her being absent. Bless her for her courage and faithfulness to you and for her responsibility. Now we commit the time to you, Lord. We ask you to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Are these waters ours, whoever put them here? Okay, great. Mine? Yours? Amen. Well, we have some Bibles to give out tonight. James Chavez. James, you here? Come on up, James. I didn't sign these yet, did I? I'm going to do that right now as uh, our brother comes up. James, God bless you. Hope we spelt your name right. Z E X. No. <laughs> and Crystal, who else is are here? Andrew and Madison, come on up. Amen. Yeah. Brian, why don't you lead us in a chorus while we do this? We serve our mighty God. We serve angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. We'll enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his court with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Madison? He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Is that all you know? No. Father, I adore you. God answers prayer in the morning. <laughs> and whatever you got. Father, I adore you. I lay my life before. Okay, let me let me get let, let, you know that? You know that? Father, I adore you. If I can fix it. Woo! You're not one of the twins, are you? You're older. Oh, you're the mom. Lay my life before you. How I love you. 
I don't think so. You want to teach it? Why don't you, why don't you teach us uh, Everybody Ought to Know? Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He of ten thousand, everybody ought to know. And Brother Bob Berlin, where are you? Bob, come on up with Missions Report. You each should have a prayer bulletin, so get a pen out and write the prayer request down. We also have missionary boards out in the foyer. We also have mailboxes for all of you. Some of you don't yet have a mailbox, I should say, but we do want you all to have one. So we'll have mailboxes for our new folks right out there in the back. Over to the left, you'll see a mailbox. Shayla, do you have a mailbox yet? All right, we'll get that for everybody. You need to check your mail. Every now and then we put a $100 bill in your mailbox. <laughs> no, check. No, no, no. That's because your wife beat you to the mailbox. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> oh my. Um, so to work on those mailboxes for next week. But do get your mail on a regular basis. And uh, take some good notes in missionaries tonight. Bob? Good evening. So we have uh, four missionary uh, church planters and uh, ministry people. Uh, the first are Larry and Deb Porter, Child, Child Evangelism Fellowship out of Rhode Island. And uh, Larry says he's very excited because there's been a lot of visitors from uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship plus the various churches doing BBS that have been coming to visit and actually have been staying to uh, worship uh, perpetual Sundays and weekdays. So he's very encouraged to see that and be a part of that. Uh, he's giving praise that Wood River had 50 children, actually. How many did we end up having? For about 50. We had about 50 here as well, so he's very encouraged by that as well. And he's also praising God that they're able to do in-person uh, Bible studies in every one of the schools that they were in before COVID, according to his article, uh, his letter. So that's great. Uh, he's just asking for prayers for more clubs more churches to hold more clubs, and for the board, the overall board members of the Child Evangelism Fellowship, I cannot say that. I've tried so many times, I just can't get too tongue-tied. CEF, we'll call it, because that's easier. So that's uh, Larry and Deb Porter, CEF, Child Evangelism Fellowship, out of Rhode Island. The next are the Dunbars, Matt and Colleen. Uh, they're based out of Philadelphia, and they are going to be missionaries to the deaf people in those areas. And he is praising God that they've had uh, many meetings uh, in May and June and July, and they've actually been able to be at five different conferences, um, preaching, teaching, uh, presenting their works. They're praising God because their uh, support has gone up from 74% to 83% uh, since the last time they looked, so they're, they're happy about that. And he's very super excited because he actually met a pastor at a meeting uh, and the pastor told him that for three years now, he's been praying for a deaf pastor to come to Philadelphia area. And that's about the time that he started the, uh, uh, his deputation. So now he's uh, all excited, and uh, he needs to pump the brakes a little bit, though, because he just wants to finish doing what he needs to do. And then uh, he'll get to Philadelphia and, and uh, continue working. So he's just very, super excited to meet somebody that was praying for him without even that person knowing it and without even uh, Mr. Dunbar knowing it either. 
They're praying for more winter meetings uh, from November through February. Uh, right now it's a little bit thin, I guess, the scheduling that they have. And they're also looking for a home to live in uh, once they finally get to Philadelphia full time. They're looking for a home and a place to live. So that's Matt and Colleen Dunbar, missionaries to the deaf people in Philadelphia. Uh, next we have Zach Campbell, just Zach Campbell. He's not married. And uh, he's actually excited and, and thanking God that he's got new churches that are taking him on uh, for support over the last few months, and that's helpful. Uh, he does hold Zoom Bible classes, uh, Bible studies, and he's seen people who taking his Bible studies and going off and uh, you know evangelizing and, and leading other people to Christ uh, from his Bible studies, so he's excited about that. And he's been able to preach and give his testimony at several camps and meetings over the summer. So he's very, uh, he's praising God for those opportunities. His prayer uh, is for September 4th. Uh, he's going to be joining Nick White of Victory Baptist Church in Dedham. And they're going to be going to Harvard with 5,000 John enrollments. And they're going to try to yeah. see what they can do uh, at Harvard University um, as part of the Ivy League uh, uh, outreach uh, for this area. So that's Zach Campbell. Uh, he is a person that goes around and tries to start Bible studies and campus churches on different uh, uh, universities and colleges around here. So he's definitely, he's been here before. Hopefully everybody's seen and met him and I think he'll be back soon. Uh, that's Zach Campbell. And last we have the Dunbars, uh, Tabernacle Baptist Church in Peabody, Mass. I looked at their letter. I didn't get uh, the names uh, of, the, of his wife. Um, he's excited because there's a lady that joined the church recently. And she, he said that she has a long road ahead of her, but he's happy that she's in church now. She's fellowshipping. She's meeting other ladies, and she's getting herself settled in. Uh, he's also praising God because back on Father's Day, there was a father that surprised his family by coming to church on Father's Day out of nowhere, and he's been coming ever since. They have, he hasn't stopped. And so they've been coming as a family since then, so he's praising God for that. And he's also started a discipleship class for the 30s and under, uh, basically singles, and he just wants to, as he puts it, reach the next generation. And he wants to try to get them uh, solid in the basics. And that's where the focus of his, uh, on, uh, his discipleship class is right now. He's praying for a new focus on door-to-door -door, uh, before the winter. He and his wife are the only ones that are basically right now doing any door-to-door -door work with their church. And uh, they were doing door knocking. But of course, like he feels that it's, it's just uh, crawling. So now he and his wife are trying to get more ground covered, more more homes. So they're they're basically going just door to door and leaving materials, but still being just the two of them. They're they're trying to get as much of that area covered as they can before the winter months come along, and, and they may scale back that uh, visitation. But those are the Dunbars Tabernacle Baptist Church in Peabody, Mass. Brian. We usually have special music, but tonight we're going to forego that so we can have a little more time in prayer. There's a whole lot to pray about, a whole lot going on in the world, and we need to do our part in uh, lifting up those believers in Afghanistan and in other parts of the world. Let's take our Bibles and open up to um, 1 Corinthians 10. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians 10. Don't ever hesitate to look at the table of contents and find out where something is. We're not born with knowledge and we're not born again with knowledge. You have to learn. It takes time to learn. But you learn by by getting it right through use of the table of contents. And if you need to, use it again. After a while, you find out an approximate place where the various books of the Bible are, and then uh, the time will come where you'll memorize them or, or choose to memorize them. That's important. Second Corinthians 10. That's something that we need to talk about tonight because it, it's, it's so often overlooked. We try to emphasize that truth here, the truth I'm going to speak about tonight, uh, 
our responsibility is to teach the whole counsel of God. So we try not to leave anything out over the course or span of time. We can't get everything into every message, but we can get things that we need to say or that God wants us to say over the course of time. And in 2 Corinthians 10.4, the scripture says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Just a couple thoughts here before we move on. Uh, the terminology doesn't imply, it expressly states that we are in a warfare. We are in a warfare. Now, you must take those words the right way. He's going to qualify his statement in a few moments to help us not get out of bounds when we read a word like that. Uh, some folks like contention. They like conflict. Uh, some folks are drawn to uh, tools of violence. I'm not speaking about uh, self-defense. Jesus authorized the apostles to get swords for self-defense. He rebuked them when they used those weapons offensively as opposed to defensively. There is a difference. He wanted them to have those weapons to protect themselves, not to go on the offense against those who were arresting him. It was God's plan for him to be arrested, falsely accused, unjustly condemned, and brutally executed. That was the plan. He didn't tell them to get swords so that he wouldn't have to be arrested. He was arrested by his own choice could have avoided the whole thing or put a whole a stop to the whole thing. So when they used the weapons against the Roman soldiers who were arresting him, he rebuked them sharply for that. But he did tell them, get a sword. Now, for your own self-defense, he was letting them know, things are going to get rough tonight. Uh, it's okay if you're armed. And there, there is no biblical reason against the use of a proper weapon in self-defense but not offensively. And when it comes to the Christian life, we are never to resort to weapons that are of the world, never. Not when it comes to living the Christian life and ministering for the Lord, because that's what it's all about. It's all about ministry. That's what it's all about. That was what it was all about for Jesus. I have come to seek and to save the lost. That's all about ministry. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. It's all about ministry, service to God in order that we might minister to others. And so it's all about that. So, so God does not authorize the use of weapons in fulfilling that responsibility of ministering. I hope we all understand that. Um, so we say, well, what can we do? Well, uh, we can pray. You know, prayer is a bit better weapon than a gun anyway. Don't you think that? Prayer is a far better weapon than a gun. When God chooses to answer a prayer in the fulfillment of his will, he can stop an enemy just like that. I've seen him do it. The Israelites knew this, even though they often forgot it. They knew it because they, they had the history of this passed down to them how that God answered prayers. And sometimes the Israelites didn't even have to lift a finger or touch a weapon and they would win the battle. That's what happened in Jericho. They didn't even have to pick up a weapon and they win. So, so, so God's, God's uh, answer to a prayer, the, the miracle working power of God is greater than a weapon. Now, we're not speaking about self-defense. God authorizes self-defense. We're not speaking about that. We're speaking about in your attempt to minister to other people, which is what it is all about. That's the purpose of your life, to minister for God. Whether you're a pastor or not, that's the purpose of your life, to, to, to do what God wants you to do to bring others to Christ. And there's no greater joy, by the way, than doing that. If you ever lead someone to the Lord or you're the instrument of them being saved, you will know the feeling. And you'll say, man, there's hardly anything like this. That because of what I did for God, someone's going to go to heaven and not to hell. That's a great feeling. And so, 
Uh, he tells us here the weapons of our warfare. Our warfare. That means that we who are saved are involved in a warfare. We cannot escape it. Whether you, whether you engage the battle or not, you are in a warfare. Now you may say, well, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to engage the battle. I'm not interested in defeating Satan. I'm not interested in rescuing others from his clutches through the use of spiritual weapons. I'm just not interested in that. Well, I want you to know he's interested in destroying your life. You are in a warfare. You, you, can't, you cannot escape that. The moment you were saved, you became an adversary of Satan. There's no question. God's word is very clear about this. Before you were saved, you, without even realizing it, were on his side. It's nothing you chose. The mere fact that you were not saved means that you were not in the Lord's family. You got saved, now you're in his family. You became a child of God when you got saved. Prior to that, you were still under the rule of the devil. That's important for us to understand. And he is the arch enemy of God. He is the adversary of God. He is the enemy of God. And when you got saved, you joined the Lord's army. You became a member of his family, and the devil became your adversary. 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, if you don't have time uh, to turn to the verses, then, then you listen. But you try to find these things, and don't get frustrated if you don't find them in time. Uh, all preachers, uh, if they're doing their work right, will give you the verse, and unless they're in a hurry, sometimes we are, uh, they'll give you time to get there, but if you don't get there because you're new with all of this, don't, don't get frustrated. Just uh, listen carefully when you don't get to something and the preacher starts to speak about it. In 1 Peter 5, um, the scripture says in verse uh, 8, be sober, be vigilant. That means be serious about these things and be, uh, be ready to deal with him. Don't be caught off guard. Be observant. Be sober, be vigilant, because now he's writing to Christians, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, that word devour does not necessarily mean to eat you alive. It means to tear you to shreds, which is what a lion does with its prey. It just tears it to shreds. That's what the devil wants to do to you and me. He wants to wreck our life. He's called the destroyer in the scriptures. That's right. He's the devourer here. He's the destroyer in other places. The destroyer, that's what he's called. That's what the Lord called him, the destroyer. Oh, my. Don't ever think that he's, you know, just a pretty good guy that went sour. He is the arch enemy of God and of you. I hate him. I hate him. I, I hate him. When you step back and look at all the tragedy in the world and broken relationships and broken homes and and on a, a divided society, when you look at all the, the wickedness around us and the corruption and, and, and the lying and the deception and, and the confusion, which the scripture says he's the author of confusion, and you see the havoc that it's wrought upon us and the, the uncertainty we now all live under and the concerns we all have for our children and our grandchildren growing up in a world like, who knows what it's going to be like, He's the author of all this. How in the world could we have any affection for him? We're told to love one another, and God loved the world, but he did not love the devil. And, and don't have any, any, any kindred spirit to him. He is wicked. He's diabolical. When he goes after somebody, he does it in a way that the only way they can withstand it is in the power of Christ. The only way. 
<clears throat> to have divine wisdom and supernatural spiritual strength. That's the only way you can withstand him when he comes at you full force. It's the only way. <clears throat> That's how diabolical he is. He's watching for what's the right time to strike against you. <clears throat> what's the right time? And so he's looking. The scripture says so. He walketh about seeking, which means looking, looking for something, looking for whom he may devour or tear to shreds. So you are in a warfare. Now, the thing we want to emphasize is the warfare is not against people. Now, people become the tools of, this, of Satan. Many of the things that the devil does to hurt people, he uses other people to do it. So people can become tools of Satan. But the people are not the enemy. It's like that gun control thing. I mean, we, we read the memes. It, it's, it's not the owner of the gun. I mean, it's not the gun. It's the owner of the gun. And we say, that makes sense. It's not the gun. The gun didn't shoot anybody. Somebody, some person picked up the gun, pulled the trigger, and shot somebody. The gun just didn't do it on its own. And it's the same thing with the devil. It's the devil causing all this trouble. Now, he uses people to do it. But he's the one who's pulling the trigger. He's the one who's pulling the strings. The people that he uses are just confused and uh, weak because they're not saved or because they're saved and they're not doing what God tells saved people to do to be strong. So people are not the enemy. Now this is also the devil's trick to get us to think that other people are the enemy. Isn't this the trick he's using in our nation? It's the trick he's using. I mean, the devil has long hated the U.S. of A. There were many outside forces that... that sought to destroy our nation in the Civil War. The prosperity of our nation, the, the, the right way of our nation, despite its faults and failures, still the best place to live. The freedom our nation affords, the gospel that goes out of America to the rest of the world, the greatest exporter of the gospel, for all of our frailties and foibles and failures and, and uh, problems as a nation, we still lead the world in putting the gospel out to the unsaved. Our country, not our government, our, our country. It's a great country. And it was greater at one time. And the devil's always hated America. But for heaven's sake. So he, he's, he's doing it now. He's getting people thinking other people are the enemy. Black folks think white folks are the enemy. White folks think black folks are the enemy. The rich think the poor are the enemy. The poor think the rich are the enemy. Good grief, where's this all going to end? This is the devil. You better mark it down. He is the author of confusion, and we are living in a confused world. And our nation has come under confusion. Hmm, it's so sad. So to, to, to be living in this generation, watching our nation go down the drain. And yet, there is a remedy, it's revival, and that rests upon God's people. We're largely to blame for what's happened. Falling asleep while the devil struck matches to burn our nation down, we just kind of fell asleep became more attracted to the things of the world and less attracted to the things of God, stopped using the weapons of our warfare, which are the utilization of Scripture and prayer, all backed up with a godly testimony. We just fumbled the football with a godly testimony, made prayer a small thing, and stopped teaching the Scriptures. You know, Jesus quoted the Scriptures. Most of you know that. When he dealt with the devil, he quoted the Scriptures. Uh, about 50 years ago, churches stopped memorizing scriptures, which is the very thing that what Jesus did in the desert when he dealt with the devil is the very thing we should learn from this. He quoted scripture. He quoted scripture. 
Now we say, well, he was God. He knows everything. No, he's our example too. He's God in the flesh. He became our example. He shows us how we can live. That's why the scripture says we're to be conformed to him. We're, we're to be like him. We're to be Christ-like. You'll never be that way in your, in your earthly life, but you can strive to be like that. Certainly, I hope that most people that have been saved for any period of time in this room are more Christ-like now than they were when they got saved. The whole idea is to become like Christ, to follow the master, to, 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 to follow the captain of our faith. He said, follow me. What does that mean if it's not to, to be where he would be and do what he would do and say what he would say, to become like him in his character? This is what you and I are supposed to do. We, and, 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 and we stop doing all this stuff. Well, who, who wants to memorize Scripture? What's the value of that? If I want to know it, I'll just look it up on my phone or something. Oh, sure, so the devil's after you, and you're going to say, can I get out my phone, devil? Oh, I have no service here. Can you, can you give me a few moments? Well, that's ridiculous. You have to memorize Scripture. That's what they did. That's why we try to memorize Scripture here. The devil quoted Scripture. Quoted. Word for word. Word for word. He didn't say, you know, somewhere in the Scriptures it says, um, hold on, devil, let me think of this. Let me call my pastor and find out. No, he didn't do that. And we're not supposed to either. We're supposed to learn God's word. We're supposed to, 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 to find the verses that will help us uh, remember the promises and obey the promises and, and the conditions and the things that, that God commands us to do in order to be strong. We're supposed to memorize those verses. They mean something. You can't memorize every verse in the Bible, though I know some will come close. But you can't, that's, that's almost impossible, but you can memorize a good portion of the verses that have to do with how to live and succeed. There's a whole, whole lot of them. A whole lot of them. We don't know the scriptures the way we should. We don't pray the way we should. We have let our, our guard down as far as our testimony of being Christ-like. So the devil just has a field day in this world. And, and sadly, the leader of the free world the U.S. of A., we just, we're just letting the whole world down. You know how many people have been on television lately saying, I cannot believe America did this. We can't believe the most powerful nation in the world did this. And here we are. We don't know what to do. I mean, <laughs> I hate to get into the whole deal, but we just leave the, 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 the Air Force base for them while we control it, we said, okay, we're out of here. Now, the other people from Great Britain, Australia, uh, Japan, they, Italy, they can't get out. Because we let the air base become the property of the Taliban. Now, nobody can get out of there unless the Taliban says you can leave. Nobody can get out of there. That's terrible. That's a shame. Now, now this isn't just net happening this is not the first time this has happened. We let Taiwan down. We let Hong Kong down. We've, we've become a nation that just says, we're done. Uh, kill them all. That's not good for us. But that's, that shows a lack of character from the top down. And we're, and we're supposed to be Christians standing against this, or at least not consenting to it. But we're, we're in a warfare. And the warfare is not against Joe Biden or the Democrats. Sure, we're supposed to exercise wisdom in how we vote. That's true. That is true. Good citizens exercise their conscience and vote according to their conscience. God wants us to let our conscience be shaped by the scriptures so that we'll vote uh, according to a standard of righteousness. That's, that's what we should do. But we're not speaking about the Democrats being the enemy. That's totally wrong. That's, that's wrong-headed thinking. That's not Bible thinking. None. None. Maybe their platform stands against the principles of God's word, but the, some of the Republican platform does too. No question about it. I mean, we're living in an imperfect world, so we shouldn't think either party is perfect. Now, some, one party may be worse than the other, which is what I would, yeah, which is what I would say. There's no question about that in my mind, but they're not the enemy. The devil's the enemy. He's trying to get our mind off of all that. 
So all we think about today is, oh, Biden this, Biden this, Biden this, Biden this, Biden this, come all of this, come all of this, come all of this, and it's the devil laughing because he's the one doing it. So what do we do? We start praying. We start finding comfort and solace in the scriptures. And the next time we have opportunity to choose leaders, we, we let the word of God guide us. Or more folks who know the Lord start running for office. We say, well, we have no chance to succeed against them. There's more of them than there are of us. Now we sound like the Israelites of old. God said, that, that land is your land. Now go take it. Oh, no, no, there's too many. We're, in the, we're outnumbered. God said, how are you outnumbered if I'm on your side? Oh, God, we, we hopefully are on God's side. I would never say he's on our side. I hope we're on his side. If we're saved and walking with, if we're saved and walking with him, then we're on his side. If we're saved and we're not walking with him, we're not on his side. Uh, according to James, we have become, we are at enmity with him. We're working against him. We may not be his enemies, but we're working against him as if we were his enemies. No, God wants saved people to, to love God, to appreciate God, to get into the word of God, to be changed by God, to love God, to, to serve God, to glorify God, to represent God. It's all about God. And God says, now, if it's all about me, it's also about others. Because what did Jesus say? He is the double commandment. Love God and then love people. So if you really want to make it all about God, God says, that's great. I'm first. Put it all, it's all about me. Now here's what I'm telling you to do. If it's all about me, love people. Do what's right for them. And so we say, I, I can't make Joe Biden my enemy. That's wrong. I'm supposed to pray for my enemies. So if I see him as an enemy, I should pray for him. Not that God kills him. <laughs> Yes, that's right. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Not a lot of rejoicing going on. What's, what's going on is, is, brings tears. You can't see the images on TV and not, not, not weep. Maybe God's people will wake up and say, you know what? Other people aren't the enemy. We're not the enemy of each other. The devil's doing this. He's creating so many problems. He's seeking to destroy people's lives. We need to start praying. We need, we need to start bringing other people to Christ. Because social change will always be brought about when people get saved. See, I'm not what I was. God has changed me. And most of you are not what you were. God has changed you. And not for the worse, for the better. That's social change. And, 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 of course, our society needs social change, but it's not going to happen because of laws. It's going to happen because people get saved. Nothing wrong with good laws, but that doesn't change society. America's never been perfect, but it was a time when it sure was a lot better than it is now. I mean, I've shared this with you. You go up and down Broad Street, we have a church that we have planted on right in the middle of South Providence. It, it, it's a, the first time I went up and down that street, and I've driven on Broad Street many times. I grew up in Rhode Island. But I never took notice of church buildings until we were looking for one. And I was just, I was literally flabbergasted how many church buildings there are on Broad Street. If you start at the Providence-Warwick border, and head uh, toward Providence. Broad Street's the longest street in Rhode Island. I did not know that. There are, there are about 75 to 100 churches on Broad Street, and some of them are massive. And most of them were built back in the late 1800s, middle to late 1800s. Now, how in the world and why in the world did they build that many churches that big? Well, people must have been going there. And most of those churches say are just a shell of what they were, if they're even churches today. So something's changed. Our society has changed. 
and it's largely due to the apathy of Christians falling prey to the devil. Now, let me ask you this. Who do we blame for, the, for sin entering into the world? The devil or Eve or both? Huh? The devil or Eve or both or Adam? Yeah, both. Both. And we're talking about two people who'd never sinned, Adam and Eve. And because of their sin, look what happened. They'd never sinned. They were in what theologians call a state of innocency. They'd never sinned. They weren't perfect, but they'd never sinned. They had the ability to sin, but they never sinned. And then the devil just, just made a suggestion. Did God really say this? You don't really think God meant that, do you? And Eve said, oh, you know, maybe not. The devil said, okay, well, then why don't you eat of the fruit then? God knows that if you eat of that fruit, you'll be like God. God doesn't want you to be like him. He's just being mean to you. So Eve said, let me have a piece of that fruit. Now, that's diabolical and deceptive. But she consented, and she gave to her husband. He did eat too, and then that was the end of it. The whole world was plunged into sin from generation to generation. Well, we're talking about two people who are in a state of innocence. And their sin caused this. The devil was the enticer, but it was their sin. God does not say, by the actions of Satan, sin entered into the world. He said, by the sin of one man, sin entered into the world. Eve said, the devil made me do it. God didn't buy that. Adam said, my wife made me do it. God didn't buy that. God said, you guys did it. You guys had never sinned before. Look what you did. Look what it caused. And now we sit here in the 20th century, 2,000 years, or 4,000 years, 5,000 years removed from these things, and we say, oh, don't blame us for what's going on in America. It's not our fault. It's the devil's fault. It's the, it's the unsaved people's fault. God said, no, it's your fault. You let the devil confuse you. You fell for the devil's tricks. The unsaved people, we're not blaming them. We fell for the devil's tricks. We were not sharp in the scriptures. We were not vigilant. We grew weary in well-doing. We became proud of our achievements as a nation. We did. We let our guard down. We stopped evangelizing our children. We did. We elected people to the school boards so that they could authorize the teaching that we all came from monkeys. We did that. And where do you think the first schools that taught this were? Where was the Scopes case fought? In what states? Anybody know? Tennessee, that's right. Oh, the Bible Belt. The Bible Belt. That's right. So, Let's quit blaming the devil. He's the devil. That's like losing a war and blaming the other side that you lost. When you had more weapons and better weapons than the enemy did. We say, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Wow, I can quote that scripture. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Then why do we keep on losing? That's a great question to answer. Can you imagine the, the, the side that keeps on losing the battles and losing more and more territory and, 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 and losing more and more soldiers says, well, it ain't our fault, it's their fault. Yeah, but you guys got more, you have more power, more weapons, more, more resources than they do. How come they keep on winning? How come the world keeps on winning? Because we're not using our weapons. And before I emphasize the use of our weapons, I have taken a long time to emphasize the enemies are not other people. So we're not talking here about guns and cannons and bombs. There's a time and a place for that. It's called self-defense. We're speaking about ministering against the devil. And no guns and no bombs and no weapons are going to help us in our battle against him. Is that right? you can't shoot him. 
So God says, I've given you two weapons. The word of God called the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. He said, this, is a, this weapon will work. Now, I've read several, I've read a number of stories through the years of people who broke into homes, of kidnappers who attempted to kidnap, of rapists who attempted to rape. And those who were the victims began to quote scripture. And you'd be surprised how many times that stopped the assailant. I'm not saying every time. But without picking up a gun, quoting the word of God, sometimes those people will stop right in their tracks. The, the weapons of our warfare. We're in a warfare. It's not against people. We do have weapons. It's the word of God and prayer. And here's the thing. If we don't use those weapons, we will resort to the others. We will. But we'll get nowhere with it. Nowhere. What weapons do you think the Israelites found the most success with? The guns or prayer? Yeah. Right. Now, again, Self-defense, own your weapons. I have no problem with that. I don't have a weapon. I'm not interested in having a gun. I'm not against the use of guns at all. I'm not against owning guns. I'm not. We have men in the church who have guns. I'm glad they do. I'm very glad they do. I think we're safer here when it comes to someone attacking us without our knowledge, unprepared. But I have no problem with self-defense. I don't think it's wrong for a man to have a gun in his home. If, if his home is invaded, he uses his gun. I have no problem with that. We read about those things happening. I don't think for a minute that that was wrong to do. But when you're ministering for God, you can't use a gun. Get saved or else. I'm the church or else. That doesn't work. Don't use God's name in vain or else. That's not what God tells us to do. It's prayer and the word of God. We say, well, what will that do as far as winning the warfare? That's how we bring people to Christ. We diminish the enemy's forces while we increase ours. I don't know why that, that strikes us as an odd thing. You know, the Ninevites, and we'll wrap up with this, the Ninevites were preparing to go to war against the Israelites. The Israelites had fallen into another one of their spiritual doldrums and weren't at all ready to win the battle God's way. And the Ninevites were fierce people. They hated the Israelites. They had done battle with the Israelites, and now they were planning a major campaign against Israel. So what did God do? Anybody? Yeah, he sent a preacher. He sent a preacher. And the whole nation got saved. And the destruction of Israel at the hands of the Ninevites was averted. Now, we claim to believe the Bible. Can't we believe that God can turn our nation around? And help us have spiritual victories? And churches planted and people saved and lives transformed? And a biblical morality returned to our nation? And then the blessings that come with that, is that not possible? That's all I would ask you, is it possible? I can't stand those preachers who say, it's we'll never have revival. No, not with you talking that way, we won't. Because you're, you're dissuading your church from seeking revival. Good grief. Whose side are you on, man? Our only hope is revival. That God's people wake up and become the people of God that we should be. That's revival. That's our only hope. So why do you want to tell your whole church that's impossible? 
That's ridiculous. In 1985, four, I was at Liberty University and the, uh, the leading preacher of Romania came to our church in Virginia. Joseph Kahn was his name, T-S-O-N. He was the most popular preacher in Romania under the thumb of the communist Russia, Soviet Union. And he asked the people there to pray for Romania. He said the Romanians are praying for themselves. He said there's such a movement among pastors and the people of Romania, especially the Christians, to get out from under the rule of Soviet dictatorship. He says it's a growing movement of prayer led by young people. Well, five or six years later, Romania, uh, the Iron Curtain was lifted. Romania had their freedoms. Uh, Ceausescu was the dictator. The people of Romania killed him, dragged his body through the streets. They stormed the capital and just they killed him. I don't know if Christians were involved in that aspect of it or not. I just know this. Through the answering of prayer, and that was Joseph Tan's testimony, through the answering of prayer of God's people, a revolution took place, and freedom resulted. That was five years after he testified to what was going on in Romania. So don't, even our own freedom here in America, with the tyranny of British rule, Largely, all of this came about due to the praying and the work of God's people. The meeting houses for the plans of the revolution were Baptist church houses. Now, yes, that was taking up arms, but it was, it was all prefaced by praying. And there were so many people praying who never lifted arms. And God answered prayers in that, that war. If you've studied the history, you know that. So we're in a warfare, brethren. What are the spoils? What, are, what, are, what do the victors in the war get? We get to see people saved. After that, we get to see, hopefully, lives transformed. And hopefully after that, we begin to see the culture changed and freedom restored. That's what I would yearn for. And I know it's possible. Whether we'll have it, only time will tell. But to deny the possibility of it, that is, then why have weapons of warfare at all if we can't win any victories with it? Let's pray, and then we'll break up into prayer groups. Father, we ask you to hear our prayers tonight. Help us, Lord, to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Lord, as good soldiers, help us to be disciplined. Help us to learn how to use the weapons you gave the Christian prayer and the study of the word. Help us to learn about this, Lord. Help us to have confidence in your weapons. You spoke the word and the world was created. Good grief. There's power in your word. There's power in prayer. Because these are things that involve you. And we do believe greater is you that is in us than he that is in the world. The world is energized by the spirit of Satan. and Your Holy Spirit lives within us. Who's greater, Lord? We know you are. So help us have confidence in your plan and in your weapons. Help us tonight, Lord, as a church to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which is really what it all in the end is about as far as these nations. And help us to pray for the Christians in Afghanistan, the missionaries, the moms and the babies and the little children, that you would avenge their blood in the way that you see fit, that freedom would rule. Oh, Lord. Help us to support missionaries to the Islamic world. And several we do support, Lord, may they prosper in bringing Muslims to Christ. Help us to love all people. And while it will be hard to do, teach us that we must do it because you love everybody. 
help us to learn how to use the weapons of the world when, when uh, we might need to, defending our homes, our property, our children, our spouses. Help us to enter the battles courageously and live for Jesus Christ, the captain of our faith. Hear our prayers tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.